Hello and welcome to a new season of Four Wheels Good. And you'll know as you've struggled to prevent your car from sliding around recently, that season is very definitely winter. That's why this week we have four special reports from reporter Mike Rutherford. Only a month ago he was enduring searing heat driving Jeeps in Argentina. But for our Four Wheels Good winter driving special, Mike finds himself somewhere slightly cooler. Well, it's almost midday, it's still darkness outside. And the reason for that is that we're up on the North Arctic Circle in the most unhospitable terrain I think you'd ever find. And the reason we're here is that Volvo have given us the keys to this car. It's their new model. They reckon it's the best car in the world, the safest car in the world, and we're going to find out. Minus 30 degrees, they're telling me, is out here, and I've got to drive a car. Been all over the world, these boots. Now, the difference between the Scandinavians and us is that they don't scrape their snow off their car because they just have too much of the stuff. This comes in handy for the small bits, but what you really need in conditions like this is a good old brush, and you just literally have to sweep the stuff away from the from the car. And this is a maybe an occurrence that, that takes place several times a day in this part of the world. You might stop and buy your newspaper and come back to the car and you can see that I'm not exactly an expert at it. But uh, I learned a bit of this in Detroit actually because this is how they clear the snow from their cars in the parts of the world where they know it's going to be cold, they know there's going to be snow and they deal with it and they have the right equipment. Just a good old-fashioned brush. Doesn't matter about the paintwork, no matter about anything, look how easily it comes off. And of course, when you're doing this, to be serious for a minute, there's no good cleaning all the glass like this unless you actually clean the light clusters. Your indicators might be down there. So probably the most important part after the actual windscreen itself is those light clusters. Your number plate as well is another thing. Don't forget the police are out to get you with their speed cameras. You want a nice clean number plate for old Bill. But see what I mean down here? That might be your indicator there. You're in the snow and ice, you've got somebody behind you. It just happens to be that it's not the indicator on this car, but imagine that that was. You leave that snow there, you do a left turn. The guy behind you says he didn't see that you were doing a left turn, and the reason is because snow was covering your, your lamp cluster. And actually, talking of lamps, on this car, if you want any demonstration that this is one of, if not the safest cars in the world, come back here and look at this. This if I'm not very much mistaken, is a stoplight. One of several stoplights on this car. And Volvo engineers have been working very hard to ensure that that stoplight comes on the split second you hit the brake. Now this is precisely what I was saying. I might, for, forgive me for, for those people who do think of things like this before setting off on this, in the snow, but uh, for others, just, just stop for a moment and just think about the way you clear the snow from your car. If you don't do this with a brush or something, you can't give an indicator to the, to the motorists surrounding you. If you don't do that, nobody's going to see you coming. So as important as cleaning the glass is, of course, cleaning these headlights and, equally important, the indicators. Do not set off until you do that. Basic, simple stuff, I know, and for most of you, you'll think of that, but a lot of people that I tell that to just say, well, you know, I've been driving for 20 years and it never, ever occurred to me. So just bear that one in mind. We're talking about saving your life and the life of your family, maybe. Do it. Now, I'm no driving expert, particularly in these conditions, which are pretty phenomenal, I have to say. <laughs> but I, I will tell you that I've picked up a few tips over the year, over the years, having travelled through Canada and the uh, Scandinavian countries over the last decade or so. And I tell you, one of the things you often see people doing is just feeling the ground. Just touch the ground for yourself, feel the road surface and say, well, if that's do it's doing that with my, with my boot, what's it going to be like with the tyre? So just really get a feel for yourself what the road surface is like. And then when you get in the car, of course, you don't want all this bulky gear. You want to be warm, but you don't need too many layers. Get the heating on, you know, stand by, have a cup of coffee if you want while the car warms itself up. Get it thoroughly demisted and uh, de-iced before you get in it. And when you get in, take those heavy layers off. You really only want to be wearing one or two layers. A nice thick sweater maybe, and a, a t-shirt or something underneath is the perfect thing. And although it might be tempting to wear your Michael Jackson gloves, Tokyo Motor Show 19... whenever it was, uh, take the gloves off, seriously. The only contact that you really have 
with the ground. In, in other words, the only way your tyres can talk to you are through the palms of your hand. When those tyres start skidding, you need to know immediately. And it's the palms of your hand that feel those tyres losing traction. It's not the glove that feels it. So get rid of that layer. And before anybody out there says, well, how come that in that case, race drivers and rally drivers don't drive with bare hands, that's because they need their gloves because of the fire risk. There's no fire risk for us ordinary punters. So when you get in the car, take the gloves off and feel that steering wheel. It's the only thing that talks to you, if you like, from the tyres. You've got to feel the road, and the best way to do that is with those bare hands. The problem is that they do let in water, and they, 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 you might think they're waterproof boots like this, but they're actually not. What you should really do is get it from your car, from the outside, into the car, and change your footwear. You're all going to laugh, you're all going to giggle, because you've all got these visions of little old me driving around with carpet slippers on. But the Scandinavians say that the perfect shoes for driving in are carpet slippers. Of course, you don't walk to your car in your carpet slippers. You walk in your Timberlands or whatever, get in the car, put on the carpet slippers. And again, it means that you've got that little bit of extra contact with, with the car. If you've got thin, soft soles on your shoes, rather than great big tread as you get on these waterproof boots or allegedly waterproof boots it means you can just feel the pedals a bit more you're a bit more in touch with the road so no gloves thin soled shoes not too many layers and the temperature inside the car is also important keep to around 18 degrees something like that we're not talking about the outside temperature we're talking about the driving cabin itself the reason for sticking to that sort of temperature is that you're not so hot that you get sort of lethargic and sleepy, which is obviously dangerous. You're not so cold that you're uncomfortable and uh, edgy and not concentrating on your driving. Stick to about 18 degrees and then that's the, the sort of perfect, the, the optimum temperature, if you like, for driving. That's not me saying that, that's the Scandinavians, in particular Volvo, who have researched this subject over the years. And they find that any colder than that, you're more likely to have an accident. Any warmer, you're more likely to have an accident. If you've got an old banger of a car and you haven't got a device that tells you the, the, the cabin temperature, then just buy a cheap old thermometer, a little old stick-on thermometer. You know the things, you can buy them for about a five. It doesn't matter where it goes, you can stick it on the dashboard, you can put it, I don't know, just somewhere in the car that gives you an indication of the temperature of the car. And the other little tip is turn that radio off, because if people are sliding around and you've got your radio on full blast, uh, you won't hear them sliding around. Turn the radio off, there's some lunatic behind you screeching possibly into the back of you, you'll literally hear him coming and you might be able to take uh, preventative action. Uh, he might be out of control, but at least he's not going to prang your car. Let's get going. Nice cap, Mike. Like it. Well, we'll see what Mike has to say about the new Volvo V70 very soon. And we'll have uh, some more winter driving tips from one of Volvo's experts. But back home, not just to the harsh realities of winter, but to the harsh realities of buying a used car. Nicky Fox has advice on how to avoid the rip-off. Whether dodgy mileage, dodgy paperwork, dodgy repairs or one of many other traps for the unwary, most can be avoided by following a few simple rules. Forget to follow them and you may find out the hard way how not to buy a car. It was ten years old, I paid over the odds, every time I got into it I felt like crying. And every time I got into it towards the end when it was costing me over £100 a month in, in just maintenance alone, I felt like getting a can of petrol, pouring it over the top of the car and setting light to it. I felt that bad about it. Do your homework. It's worth investing a few quid in the second-hand listings. Then decide how much you want to spend, what model you want and how old it's going to be and stick to that decision. An impulse buy is OK for a bar of chocolate, but after your home, a car's likely to be the biggest investment you make. I had a fixed amount of money and I knew I couldn't go over that, but I saw the car and I really liked it, so I did go over my money. It was too expensive for me, I couldn't really afford it. Check everything in the ad. Is that a private number or is it a cell phone, which might just indicate a fly-by-night vendor? Is the ad marked with a T, which means trader in a press ad? Take someone along who knows about cars and is happy to show off a bit. And if you're a woman, take someone along anyway, whether you know all about cars or not. Uh, I bought a sports car once, only had it a couple of weeks and uh, the engine blew. 
And then there's various other problems went wrong with it. And I eventually found out it was an insurance write-off rebuild. Very disappointing. It cost me a lot of money. If you're meeting the vendor in a street outside a house, do they actually live there so you can trace them if something goes wrong? Ask them to go inside and get the paperwork or fetch you a glass of water. We bought a second-hand car and eventually found out the hatchback never quite fitted properly. It's, um, it's one of those things that leaves a sort of a nasty taste in your mouth, not being pointed out at the time. We put up with it and eventually sold it, but uh, never totally pleased with the car because of that. Have you time to check on the HP status, the insurance status? If it's a repaired crash, do you still want it? I found out after I bought it that um, it had actually been involved in an accident, it being sprayed a different colour. I've had to buy two new front wings for it, so it's ended up quite a lot more expensive than I can afford, really. Now, will he take a cheque or does he insist on cash? The few days it takes a cheque to clear will give you time to check out both the car and its paperwork. The car looked so good that we thought, great, this is the one we want. So we didn't really bother checking the t paperwork or anything. Don't know where the MOT came from or anything. Just pleased to have it. Don't rush into a purchase because it looks as though the vendor needs the money or because you don't want to be any more trouble or even because you're short of time to look at cars. I'd only been driving it for about two or three hours when I realised it wanted to turn right a lot. And going into left-hand bends, you had to fight the steering wheel. Pick your time and don't look at a car in the dark. Also, rain will mask body flaws and put pressure on you to make up your mind more quickly than you should. And finally, remember, you can always walk away from a car. There are lots and lots and lots of them out there to choose from, and one of them just has to have your name on it. Mm, as they say, caveat emptor. Now, wrap up warm, because after the break, Mike Rutherford will be driving his new V70 way up in the very north of frozen Norway in a place called Kirkness. The conditions there call for special driving skills and maybe also a special new model of car. I've got to say that if you are in conditions like this, and I have to be honest and tell you, I don't enjoy particularly driving in this kind of situation i guess you might as well be in something like this what i'm really saying is i'd rather be in the uh, all-wheel drive vol volvo than probably anything else in the world maybe a jeep grand, grand, grand cherokee maybe something like that i mean you just feel very very vulnerable until you get in here and think about what's around you. The side impact protection system, in case you get sideswiped by a truck, there are a lot of trucks coming along this road, logging lorries and things like that. Well, we're in from the minus 30 degrees, which is what it is out there. It's now about one o'clock. We just had our lunch, an early lunch. It's absolutely pitch black out there. It's like 10 o'clock at night. This is the only place to be, and that's inside. And I'm joined by Alan Deitch, Deitch. Deitch it is, yeah. Now, from a name like that, Alan, people might think logically enough that you're Swedish, mm. but in fact, you're a Geordie. That's right. <laughs> I uh, used to work in England for a safety centre, and um, I had quite a lot of contact with Volvo, and at one time they asked me if I'd like to come over and work here. So it was about 10 years ago, and I haven't looked back since. And you're not the only Brit. In fact, you're not the only Geordie working no. for uh, Volvo, because, of course, there's a very important guy in the design studio. Yes, we've got Pete Aubrey there, who... Uh, I wouldn't say he's a good friend of mine, but I do meet him in a pub now and again. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's nice to see. Geordie's behaving like Geordie should behave yeah. in Gothenburg, are they? That's right. We know a nice pub, the <laughs> Dublin is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The less we say about that, the yeah. better, I think. Um, but tell it, you're responsible for safety for this vehicle. Mm -hmm. Talk us through some of the safety features. We've got obvious things like airbags, but what are these fellas, for example? Yeah. Okay. This is the side impact airbag, which uh, inflates when we... Uh, we push the, the side of the car against the sensor here and the idea is that we stop the occupant with this bag instead of the side of the car pushing directly on the chest. Okay, that's interesting there. We've got a passenger side airbag mm -hmm. over there. Now, that doesn't come as standard uh, in a Volvo, does it? For, for a peculiar safety reason. It's, uh, it is a marketing uh, decision to some extent. In America, we have to put that bag in. In uh, Europe, we give the option to the customer whether he wants it or not. Am I right in thinking that's largely because some customers might put kids in the, in the baby seats in the front and therefore the last thing you want is a combination of, of a front baby seat plus a passenger side airbag? That could be one of the reasons, mm. yes. What about um, 
the, the, the SIPS side impact protection mm -hmm. system. In layman's terms, how does that work? This is, as you see here, we have the structure which goes across through the seats here. So when we push on this side of the car, we can then use the other side of the car through this box here to give a, a, a lot stiffer structure. So mm -hmm. we can control the intrusion and reduce its severity. Right. So you're not strapped in, bolted in a static and very vulnerable object. You're actually moving over with the impact, as it were. Um, we reduce the severity of the impact, mm -hmm. I think was the way to describe it. Okay. The steering wheel is interesting and the steering column in particular, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Lots of inbuilt safety features there. Yes, what we have is uh, a lot of collapsible elements in the steering system. I don't know if you can see this, but we have a shaft here which is disconnected at the moment, which can collapse. And we have a link here and a link here which allows a flexibility in there. Then one of the most important parts, we have a collapsible element which we can push the steering wheel here forwards about 80 millimetres if the severity of the, the crash is such that we actually contact steering wheel. Mm. Another nice little touch I think, and I don't know if this is consciously a safety feature, but it seems to me uh, a safety feature in that you've got huge buttons on the stereo system, which mm -hmm. means you're not fiddling around for pinheads, you yeah. can actually find... Safety is not just a matter of crash protection, it's the whole environment of the mm. car. Mm. I think you have to think of the car as a, a unit, mm. so we try and make the car warm, the window should uh, defrost, etc. So we we make things so easy for the driver that he's not distracted. And one of the obvious things is have the knobs that you can, mm. you can do in a cold winter's day with gloves on, for sure. example. Well, this is interesting. We've been driving for precisely 24.3 kilometres. We left the car for about 10 minutes before we got into it to let the thing warm up. And you would have thought, wouldn't you, that uh, Volvo had mastered the art of uh, demisting and defrosting cars. And yet there's nothing but nothing we can do about this problem. What we've effectively got with this pack of snow here is a blind spot which joined with the A pillar here means that we've got an A pillar that's effectively sort of four or five inches wide and I'm surprised that Volvo can't find a way to defrost or de-ice this part of the screen because like I said you've got this terrible blind spot. I know what you're thinking, I could always get out, rip it off or brush it off but uh, if they'd have thought it through properly they would have found a way to eliminate this. Well, Volvo owners will immediately notice a huge difference in the interior of this vehicle. It's much, much better than the old vehicle. It's much rounder, it's much more modern, it's much more 90s, but it's still very familiar and uh, it's, it's uh, evolutionary rather than revolutionary. And I don't think that's a bad thing because generally speaking, as one of our colleagues flies past us at uh, approximately 100 kilometers an hour on a road that says 60 on a road where we're told the Norwegian police are out to get us and on a road incidentally that is minus five degrees very icy very slippery and even in this four-wheel drive vehicle feel that well you didn't I did that tail end was having a little wiggle then and he's just gone past 100 k's an hour it's up to him he must be a German anyway um, because we are actually here with the, the press from around the world and, uh, and again that says something I think for Volvo that they've got the confidence to actually say to journalists from all over the world come to these conditions and a lot of people are not used to these conditions and uh, put the car through its paces you know it's the old old story you make them or we make them say Volvo you try and break them and uh, you'd have a job 
brake in a car like this, let me tell you, unless you put it into the side of that mountain there. But I digress, back to this dashboard. It's round, it's modern, it's much more familiar, it, well, it's as familiar as the old one. Everything seems to be in the right place, but I'm a little bit annoyed that they've chosen to uh, mess around with the positioning of some of the switches. I've already mentioned, I think, earlier the, the hazard warning light switch, and I, I, I've been in the car for about half an hour now, and I still can't find the, uh, the switch for the sunroof. Don't know where that is, not that you'd want it on a day like this, but uh, why do you have to hunt around for these things when... Uh, it should, oh, that, look, there it is. There it is, I finally found it. I'm sure it's not in that position in the old 850. Uh, the window switches, they were never on this arm here. They were down by the gear stick. Uh, so they've gone from here onto the armrest. I'm not sure, if, oh, the same goes for these uh, uh, remote control buttons for the, uh, for the door, door mirrors, the electrically uh, mounted door mirrors. And uh, again, I'm not sure that that's a positive move forward or not. This steering wheel is interesting. It looks like pretty much any other steering wheel. I mean, you know, it's round. It's got an airbag in the middle, like most of them do. Um, it's got the horn in the right place. That's where you need a horn, in the centre, not on the end of these stalks here. So that's the perfect positioning for the steering wheel, for, for, the, uh, for the horn. Lovely size, lovely feel to the, to the wheel. Um, but there's more to this steering wheel than meets the eye. It actually collapses. It's a three-part steering wheel. So in the event of an accident, you know, Volvo attention to safety and that's a bit closer and we've got fuel down there so I honestly don't want to go too close to that edge because uh, it'll be bloody cold in there. Anyway, uh, I'm joined this morning by Jose Diaz de la Vega, I think that's right. Yes. Yet another foreigner working for the uh, Volvo Corporation in Gothenburg. Yeah. Jose, you're responsible for the interior of the new cars, the S17 yeah. and the V70. Mm -hmm. Dramatic change to the dashboard. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Uh, having the, had feedback from the A50 series, uh, we recognized there were uh, flaws in the, in the program. So we set out to achieve uh, higher goals. Mm. I, I, was, I was driving yesterday and I described it as evolutionary rather than revolutionary. You instantly know it's a Volvo dashboard, yeah. but it's massively different from the old one when you look carefully. Yes, yes, that's correct. Uh, and the same way as you keep uh, an identity on the exterior character of cars, Volvos in this case, we, we are doing the same here. We want that identity to be maintained, family lines. How would you describe it? Softer, rounder? Uh, it's crisp, crisper, but with more uh, innuendos on the softer character. Mm. So we have the strong lines, what I call the trapezoidal area, driver appointment, which is very much Volvo. Uh, and that's definite, it's well defined. But when you move to the passenger, it's more subdued, more refined. All the surfaces are cleaner, softer, friendlier. Mm. So you as a passenger, you feel a bit more cosseted. Yeah, I, I mean, I, th th that's the word I was going to use. The, the, the old dash was very square-like. It was almost offensive, wasn't it? Yes. It was like a huge brick wall in front of you. Yeah. This is much more contoured. Yes. But like I said, you've kept with tradition, and yes. pretty much everything is in the same place. All these uh, dials and switches are in the same area. Mm -hmm. uh, but correct me if I'm wrong, the hazard warning switch on the old one was around about here? Yes, that's correct. That's moved down to here. What's yes. the thinking there? Well. Uh, first of all, we wanted to create a common identity with our products when it comes to operational switches. Uh, something else, we wanted to create a, a greater level of safety. So before the switch was accessible mostly by the driver, mm. and in this case now is within easy reach from the passengers mm. near to the seats. Mm. So you are in the middle of the car, and that helps this. Yeah, I mean, for anybody out there wondering what the relevance is of the hazard warning switch for the passenger. Don't forget that there might be an occasion where the driver has a problem, is ill or something, yes. has broken down, heart attack, whatever, and it means that somebody from the back has got to lean over and hit that hazard warning switch. I also, right. I also seem to remember the buttons for the, uh, the switches for the electric windows and the mirrors were down here. That's correct. They've disappeared too. Yes, yes we, we've, uh, first of all, we found out the separate logic on operation. When you are going to a toll gate or a service station, you address the window, but you have to turn your eyes onto the centre mm. console. Mm. So we said, well, that doesn't isn't not on the logic, mm. and we had experienced that on the 960 as well, mm. S90. So we moved that to the door. Uh, this is this is great stuff because yeah. we have here. Maybe you'll demonstrate what this little thing can do. Yes. 
This is uh, demand of some markets. Uh, if we talk about Japan specifically, uh, navigational systems. That's cute. It's basically, is to allow you to find your way around towns. Uh, Central Europe as well, we, we have found a demand here. Mm. I mean, for anybody looking at this thinking, what the hell is that? In years to come, when the infrastructure is in place, because these systems are only as good as the infrastructure behind yes. them. Yeah. Uh, in, in years to come, you'll be able to look at one of these screens. It'll be able to tell you how to get to the local hospital, restaurants, wherever. The problem at the moment is that they're not really geared up for everyday use. Mm. And the other problem is that they st usually stick out of a dashboard yes. like a sore thumb. Yes. This one is integrated. Yes. And uh, it's further demonstration that uh, you can't have foreign objects uh, protruding into the passenger compartment. Yeah, that's correct. quite ironic really with all the modes of transport in this part of the world be it Volvo cars, skidoos, those little uh, uh, sleigh things that the, uh, the little old ladies use in town. The best form of transport you would have thought was the natural beast, the reindeer, but I've been told categorically you cannot ride these animals so to speak but you can if you just go a little way south down to Russia the Russian reindeer you can ride. These ones you can't. Tell them mate, we'll have you for dinner. And he told me he was a vegetarian. Well, I think he'll be spared well, seeing Mike uh, eating a reindeer, but we will be returning to him soon to see how he gets on driving his Volvo V70 on that frozen fjord. First, though, a quick break, and then maybe the perfect answer to the problem of having the Formula One urge, but no cash to fund it. Join us soon to find out more. Hi, welcome back. Now, have you seriously thought of becoming a professional race driver? The problem is, of course, where to find the huge sums needed to fund anything near Formula One. Well, let's look at a cheaper alternative, which can be just as much fun, Formula 600. I designed this car 14 years ago for hill climb use, and we've developed it and uprated every, ever since. And so it's a well-sorted, um, well-prepared machine that is strong and will take a lot of abuse. Interested in motorsport for a, a good while now, about the past 10 years, and years really, as far as I can remember. A few of us bought a, a pro kart and did a few races with that. We still race it, small endurance races, three hours, 10 hours, occasional 24 hours if we could refer up to it. Um, and I thought I want to get into something else basically, you know, move a bit more of a challenge. Although the Formula 600 Championship is probably the best way to get into um, the lower formulas of motorsport because of the price. So I'm just trying now to um, raise a bit more cash to um, purchase one of these Super Formula 600 machines, really. The basic cost of the car is um, 17, 18,000 18, pounds. I've raised, managed to raise about eight, nine on my own. John and the Formula 600 team reckon we can run a, run a champions on about 5,000 a year, so that's really, really helpful. I've approached um, various major companies. Um, I work for British Airways, I've approached them. I don't know if they're going to help me out. Um, smaller companies, local companies where I live in London, I've tried to approach. Um, other, sm other sponsors have not really had much luck on the sponsorship side. But I'm still trying, still trying. Yeah, I think one of the main problems is a lot of the main com major companies haven't heard about Formula 600, so they will be anxious basically to find out what's going on and know a bit more about the Formula before they get involved in helping us out. But once they do come along and see what goes on, what the car, what the car's like, what's involved, and what it really does, I think their um, impressions will change. Because um, it is a very good formula. Uh, it's good for the people entering motorsport, and I think it is going to be a challenge to 
the other lower formulas will be up there competing with them. So um, their impressions will change. Yeah. The car is a 600cc Honda, um, Honda engine, the bike engine, bike engine which is quite different. But it's been, the idea has been around for quite a while. The idea has been there, but hasn't really been using the formula in a championship in any form. Uh, uses the same six-speed gearbox, and I suppose it reaches speeds of between 100 and 130, 140. So it goes some. The car weighs about 600 pounds and that gives about 400 horsepower per tonne. That's really what I know really, not 60 times, I'm not really quite sure of. Um, uses a six-speed box, like I said before, sequential box, left-hand side, um, which is very easy to use. So for the first-time driver or first-time user, it's really an ideal situation to get involved with. So you get in the car, first time I drove, got in it, I was in there straight away driving up and down. Got quite used to it very quickly. Really good fun. I, I sort of come from grass, a grassing background, um, which is basically an open wheel special with a GSXR 1100 in back. Um, and basically, I, I got approached and asked if I'd like to test out Formula 600, which is what I'm doing here today. As far as I know, I'm only a girl that's that's uh, taking part in it so far, but hopefully there'll be be a few more. I started it in, in May, having had a discussion with Dudley Wood, who was looking for a formula to, uh, to run his two boys in, uh, who'd been racing carts. And he, um, he'd been to get, to get a quote on, uh, on using Vauxhall Junior, and he was rather shattered by the cost of it. Um, we decided to try this car on a circuit, which I had done quite a bit of testing before on circuits. And he tried it, I was very surprised how well it went, and then we moved from there. We have a championship run by the British Race and Sports Car Club and the first round is at Castle Coombe on Easter Monday and there are 12 rounds of the championship all together on major British circuits. So ne next year we should get a whole series. The red one's almost got my name on it. All I need to raise is another 8, 8k and um, I'll be racing next year. If anybody out there wants to help me, feel free. Well, good luck with your fundraising, David. Hope you make it. It certainly looks like a lot of fun. This is Four Wheels Good, and we now return to our winter driving theme. Mike Rutherford in Norway discovers how effective all-wheel drive can be when coping with icy conditions. If you get it wrong around here, and you come off the road and you slide into a truck, you might just slide into something like this. This is what I call a snowplow. All the more reason to have four-wheel drive on your car. Well, I'm joined by Kent Johansson, responsible for the four-wheel drive system on the new Volvo. Good old-fashioned Swedish name, Johansson. Kent, tell us about this four-wheel drive system. You call it all-wheel drive. Yeah. Now, for the benefit of people that don't know, and apologies to those listeners who do understand this subject, there is no difference, is there, between all-wheel drive, four-wheel drive, four-by-four, call it what you will. Yeah. It's a four-wheel drive system, correct? Yeah. Yes and no, I will say, because we have a system that we would not like to have always four-wheel drive on dry surfaces, for example. We prefer that have a two-wheel driven car on dry surfaces, hot climate and so on. You don't have the necessary to use the 4x4. Four four. Mm. Uh, we have a system that's usually on dry surfaces. It's a front-wheel driven car and that admits us to have such a low fuel consumption for an all-wheel driving car. Okay. In layman's terms, we've got a system on this car, which means that you've got four-wheel drive switching itself on and off yeah. as necessary. Yeah. The brain in the car decides when you want four-wheel drive, yeah. when you need four-wheel drive, yeah. and it does the switching for you. There's none of this archaic yeah. switching anything here or pulling levers here. Yeah. We will, we, our opinion is that the customer doesn't, has to have all the knowledge of all the technical system mm. in a car and therefore we looked for a system that is totally automatic mm. so you use it when you want it but the customer doesn't really notice it mm. but it's always there that's interesting and would you say in a country like sweden i mean how mm. often 
would the, the four-wheel drive system cut in? As you say, possibly without the driver even knowing. Would mm-hmm. it be, I don't know, in, during the course of a winter, would it be 10% of the car's driving time, 50%? I mean, could it be that you might actually drive the car on the four-wheel drive or never cut in? It's all resin, I will say, because it, the car is still uh, an all-wheel driven car always, but we have quite a, uh, a, uh, quite a little torque from the engine to the rear axle during dry surface and hot climate, mm-hmm. but we still have uh, an all-wheel driven car. And what we get there is that we have a very good stability of the mm. car uh, during handling, mm. during going on a uh, high road and so on. Mm. And all-wheel drive does what exactly? I, I liken four-wheel drive to perhaps, um, imagine that, that, that you're perhaps trying to walk on ice. If you're just relying on two feet, yeah. two-wheel drive, yeah. it's kind of difficult. If you've got four-wheel drive, yeah. two, hands and, yeah. two hands and two feet, yeah. as an animal walks, you've got that much more traction. Yeah. It makes movement safer yeah. and easier. It's, it's a very similar system with cars, isn't it? Yeah. Now, having said all that, you've sold me to the benefits of four-wheel drive. I'd rather have four-wheel drive than not have four-wheel drive, Mm -hmm. even in England where we have comparatively mild winters. Mm -hmm. But Volvo hasn't always taken that line in the past. In fact, I'm pretty certain that years ago, you guys from Volvo used to say to me, four-wheel drive, all-wheel drive, don't need it. agree. It's correct from you. Ten years ago or something, we uh, said that Volvo will never have all-wheel drive. Uh, If you look rearwards in the mirror and... uh, go into the system that was on the market 10, 15 years ago or something. Our uh, requirements that we have within Volvo, the system that uh, you could buy 10, 15 years ago didn't fulfill our uh, our requirement Mm. regarding properties, regarding as handling, braking, uh, prestanda and so on. And also, uh, and this behavior of the system that you can buy 10, 15 years ago was a Unsecure is mm. our our opinion because the car changed the behavior mm. and so on. So the four-wheel drive systems that you're buying in from I don't know a manufacturer like Bosch or whoever yeah. is more sophisticated and meets Volvo standards, whereas 10, 15 years ago that wasn't the case. Oh, exactly, because mm. we we have priority for the brake system, for mm. example. We can't change the brake properties in the car. Uh, when we put the all-wheel drive system in the car. Mm. And therefore we have been looking for a lot of years for a system that fulfill the requirements that we already have Mm. on the front-wheel driving car. Mm. Well, we're not silly. We've uh, our mission this morning is to go out on this frozen lake and drive on it. We've had a word with a few of the locals and the tourist board, and they said it's cold enough. It's thawing a bit because it's only about minus 28, but uh, they reckon that we should be all right, and it'll take the weight of our uh, all-wheel drive V70. But what we thought we'd do is that we get a few of these local reindeer to check it out for us. We've got the herdsmen to put the reindeer through. And uh, if there is any danger of the lake thawing out, and I can't imagine there is at these temperatures, but just in case, we've got the reindeer out there literally sort of testing the ice or testing the water for us. And none of them have fallen through yet, so I think we're safe. And um, the other bonus, of course, with these reindeer, he's asked us to pick one out, and uh, whichever one we fancy, we're going to barbecue over lunch. So uh, all you animal rights people, just make note of that. But man's got to survive up here in the, in the hostile North Cape.
it's up to you. You can take some risks this winter. You can just do what you do every winter and go out there and hope for the best. But uh, the other way of dealing with it is to actually say to yourself, I don't know, I'm going to clue myself up this winter. I'm going to think about ice. I'm going to think about snow. I'm going to think about cold weather driving. And who better to tell us how to handle those conditions than our old friend Kent Johansson, who's going to talk us through maybe some life-saving tips, Kent. And yeah. I think what we first need to do is differentiate between ice and snow. Yeah. I think a bigger problem for people in England yeah. is when they switch on the radio in the morning and they hear there's going to be some ice out there, icy roads, yeah. black ice, maybe yeah. minus one degree, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Give us some tips. How do we stay alive? How do we avoid those crashes? Absolutely. The first thing, you have to keep the speed down. Maybe the half of it or whatever. Uh, the problem in uh, the normal traffic into the cities is that the cars are too close to each other. So when the car in front of you uh, starts to brake, you must have one, two, three seconds to uh, make action and start to braking. And you, this distance you have today is too short, so you will go straight into the rear to the car in front of you. So what do you less do? speed and a greater distance between greater vehicles? Greater distance. Double it up. And a uh, very simple uh, rule we have here in Sweden that we are calculating six seconds. So the, when the car in front of you has uh, across the point, whatever, a tree or whatever, you calculate six seconds. Yeah. Then you have a distance which is enough. Okay. The other thing, of course, is if your car goes into a skid, well, actually, let's correct that. Your car does not go into a skid. You, the driver, put your car into a skid. Yeah. I mean, I think people have to think in those terms. The yeah. skid is up to you, the yeah. driver. Yeah. If you lose control, you're skidding, yeah. your steering is gone, yeah. you've got no steering, yeah. you've got no brakes, what do you do? Well, the first thing, put the clutch down, so you release the engine totally. And that, what you are doing then is that the wheels can start to roll, roll themselves and then you will uh, get the steering back again. Second thing is that if you have an ABS system for the brake system, push the brake pedal as far as you can. Hang on in there. Yeah. If you don't have a car with ABS system, you have to pump the brake pedal on and off. So tip on, tip off, tip on, tip off. As and quickly as possible. Yeah. And then try to steer with the steering wheel in that direction that you are going to steer into the skid. Yeah. The problem is, I always hear that advice, steer into the skid. If you're skidding towards a lamppost and somebody's telling you to steer into the, squid, yeah. the skid, <laughs> it's kind of difficult to do. Yeah, but of course, you have to always, you can't look just forward if you have a slid. You have to look the way you are going. So sometimes you have to uh, look into uh, the side window, for example. Mm. Also, very gentle manoeuvres, right? Yeah, Not too smoothly. much uh, vigorous steering, yeah. vigorous uh, footwork. Be as smooth as you can, both yeah. for accelerate, braking, yeah. changing gears or whatever. Yeah. What about some other tips? I mean, if you're in the snow, it's slightly different, isn't it? I yeah. mean, uh, ice worries me more than yeah. snow. Am I, yeah. is that, have I got a false sense of security there or have I got that one about right? Uh, the, um, the big difference between snow and ice is that you can buy a winter tyre without uh, studs. That tyre uh, is quite good on snow, but a tyre without studs doesn't function at all on mm. ice. Mm. So if, when you have ice, the only thing you can do is to buy tyres mm. with studs. Mm. What about the sort of clothing and footwear you should use when you're in the car? Yeah. Uh, please take away your jacket. Do like this so you can see uh, all the way around. Uh, then another thing, try to sit a little bit closer to the steering wheel, so you're not sitting uh, with longer arms. You will have a much better feeling of the car then. If the ordinary guy is out there and he can't afford a four-wheel drive car, he can only afford two-wheel drive, excuse us if we're sounding a little bit... <laughs> <laughs> if we're sounding a little bit cold and shivery, but we are bloody freezing, I tell you. Um, God, it is cold. If somebody's got a two-wheel drive car yep. and he's not a very experienced driver, should he go for a front-wheel drive or a rear-wheel drive car? There's a lot of confusion about that, isn't there? My opinion and Volvo's opinion is to use a front-wheel driving car. 
let's get back to this subject though. It's training, isn't it? You've mm -hmm. got to get out there. You've got to yeah. experience yeah. this so you can practice. Yeah. Uh, as I have told some other guys here that when we take a driving license in Sweden, uh, we have a requirement that everyone who uh, would like to have a driving license must test really slippery uh, ice driving. Mm. Make an area around you, both in front and in the rear. Yeah. And if you have a car behind you, which is very close to you, uh, go off the road, mm. let him go then, and mm. start out, start again. Yep, absolutely. Well, it's still daylight, as you can see. About three or four in the afternoon. Very weird, this. A bit like being jet-lagged, being in this darkness all the time somehow. We've done the driving of the cars, but, you know, even a car person like me grumbles at how boring cars are when you've got the option of skidoos or ski scooters, snowmobiles, call them what you are. They're basically 80 horsepower little motorbikes, Yamahas, with skis on the bottom. It means you can thrash around a field like this, you can actually ride the things on the road. Great fun, beach driving any day. Let's go and have a go. <laughs> Well, a lad's going to have some fun, isn't he? A fancy go at that myself. Well, I hope you found this week's winter motoring tips useful. Now, there's no excuse for losing control of your car on the ice. And there's no excuse for missing next week's special programme with Mike Rutherford and Ginny Buckley reporting from the world's most important motoring extravaganza, the Detroit Auto Show. Around $2 million alone was spent on the press launch of the new Corvette, which included an extraordinary lavish illusion where a Corvette and its occupant disappeared in Detroit and reappeared seconds later in Los Angeles. Impressive or what? We'll have pictures of this and all the other razzmatazz from Detroit in next week's show. We'll see you then. <laughs>